Start it, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, the systems uh, both session. We can actually discuss anything here, but to get started, uh, we prepared some slides. First of all, about our newly released machine. So we normally release machines every two years, and the previous one was called Z15. And yeah, now unsurprisingly, it's Z16. The uh, the machines. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, the machines are normally quite big, so you see we used to have 190 cores in the maximum configuration in the previous generation. Now it's upgraded to 200. The size of caches has also grown significantly, especially uh, L2 and L4. And we've switched to a different uh, technology from 14 to 7 nanometers. And uh, yeah, here you see the photo of the chip. Uh, on the next slide, we have uh, a description of uh, what is what. So, as you can see, we have eight cores on every processor chip. And uh, yeah, if you're wondering about the whole system topology on every drawer, drawer is like a motherboard. We have four of these, and then there are four drawers. So, in total, 256 cores if you multiply all the values. And uh, yeah. Uh, not all of them are available to end users, so it's just 200 that are available to the end users. Um, and uh, also there are a bunch of, okay, how do I point? Yeah, a bunch of accelerators. So this is AI unit, I'll be talking about it a bit later. And this is the deflate acceleration unit. So um, yeah, quite a few things right on the CPU chip uh, with uh, the Especially with the caches, it has been a very interesting update because before we had a really traditional structure where, where we had L1, L2, L3, L4, uh, like a hierarchy like everybody else. Uh, this time, physically, we have only L2s, but these L2s are, can be shared between different cores and between, and between different CP chips. And from that arises virtual L3 and L4 caches. Um, this is based on the observation that uh, machines might not be fully loaded all the time, and therefore cores can benefit from caches on other cores. And uh, indeed, uh, simulations show that uh, in real workloads, every core has about 50% more cache than before. Um, yeah. So another update is, of course, that we have new uh, machine instructions. One update has been to our vector decimal support. Uh, IBM Z has already a lot of instructions uh, regarding decimal, handling decimal point in hardware. Unfortunately, uh, that's not widely utilized in the open source projects. It's mostly for uh, proprietary code, so I'll just mention this and uh, go further. Um, so this is probably the most exciting thing in, the, thing in this release. Uh, so there is this new uh, chip that's located right on the CPU uh, that helps with machine learning. And um, this chip is driven by a new machine instruction called an NPA, Neural Network Processing Assist. Uh, since this uh, chip uses its own floating point format, so it's 16-bit uh, with, I think, 6-bit exponent, so completely non-standard, um, there are a few instructions that help you quickly convert between standard and this non-standard data format. And yeah, last but not least, uh, several uh, instructions that, that help with kernel development, I think, to uh, to the tools community, th these two might be interesting because we have this uh, last break in event register, bear, and uh, it's visible actually in JDB. However, due to security reasons, we have to reset it on every context switch because otherwise uh, we will see kernel address in there from user space, which is not good. So sometimes in JDB you cannot uh, find or see what uh, the last jump was, and with the introduction of these two instructions, we can not simply reset it in the kernel, but rather load and store. So, uh, with the new hardware, this support should be fixed and fully working. 
Um, okay, so in terms of uh, toolchain updates, uh, since there are not too many new hardware instructions, not uh, too much has changed. Uh, in particular, in GNU assembly, we of course support all the new monics. For the new instructions, we have introduced new M architecture, Z16. Uh, well, uh, as I said, it's called Z16 and it's no surprise, but for example, four generations ago, I think it was ZEC12, so not Z12. Uh, therefore, we normally cannot, uh, even if we know internally how the machine is going to be called, we cannot release this uh, to the public, therefore, we just do some counting, Arch 14, next is going to be Arch 15, etc. And then at later point in time, when the announcement comes, we introduce that. So, uh, yeah, a peculiarity of our platform. And then some of the instructions have been exposed as intrinsics. These are for AI and those you have already seen. So, yeah, now coming to the uh, machine learning accelerator. So there it is. Quite, yeah, quite big, maybe as large as one L2 cache. Um, so every AI, so AI accelerators you have on every chip. So one AI accelerator delivers about six, six teraflops. Uh, and then if you look at the full system, if uh, yeah, it has the maximum amount of CPUs, it's uh, about 200. Um, so what uh, does this give us? Because normally, you know, everybody does AI on video cards, for example. Uh, one of the biggest uh, advantages is better latency because it can just talk directly to the cache. Um, and yeah, that's, I would say, the main benefit. Of course, you may also wonder what if uh, we just did all the operations that are required for machine learning, like, for example, matrix multiplication using existing vector instructions. And uh, benchmark shows, benchmarks show that this is now much, much faster orders of magnitude. So this is uh, definitely worth it. And uh, does the vector unit of the main CPU support half float format? No, no. no. So, you, okay. well, I mean, you have now uh, the conversion instructions, but that's the only thing it, it can do with them. So, what number of bits in the DL float? Sorry? The number of bits of DL float format? 16. 16, mm -hmm. okay. So, for AI, you don't need too much precision, so that's why, yeah. But that does mean that uh, you can't load, or you shouldn't probably load uh, every CPU with an AI accelerator using application, right? Because there's only one and one per eight CPUs, right? Um, yeah, so if you want to have basically maximum performance, you can only run one yeah, so we, we have, AI we actually, workload per ship, basically. We, we actually had these discussions in context of uh, other simulator, uh, sorry, accelerators like the compression accelerator, yeah. because that's exactly the same story. Yeah. And of course, ideally, applications should be like aware of that. Uh, yeah, we also toyed with ideas of some auto tuning in kernel because we have hardware counters which say like how much these units are utilized, and then maybe the scheduler could know about this. But uh, yeah, this was too far fetched, so we didn't uh, go forward with this. Yes, as far as I remember, Intel had some proposal. Uh, some similar proposal for the kernel, but I'm not sure if uh, it went anywhere, like load aware scheduling or something, something along these lines. But okay. Um, so what uh, what exactly can it do? Can it do if we don't use buzzwords like AI or deep learning? So there are uh, a bunch of uh, it's simply a bunch of mathematical functions. Uh, in the simplest case, just element-wise addition, subtraction, etc. But then, of course, there are functions that are used for neural networks, uh, so activation functions, ReLU, um, yeah, etc. Sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm standing at the wrong place. Okay. Uh huh. Yes. Uh, now I see myself. <laughs> Very good. 
Um, for general neural network support, we have matrix multiplication and batch normalization. That's, I think, normally used, especially the last one uh, during training. And uh, for convolutional neural networks, that's like, uh, as far as I know, for image recognition, uh, max pool, two-dimensional max pool, two-dimensional average pool, and of course, convolutions themselves. And finally, for recursive neural networks, that's, as far as I know, for, used for working with text. We have LSTM and GRU functions. So that's, uh, yeah, that's all there is. But I would say quite, quite, quite a lot for today's state-of-the-art machine learning. Uh, so we have all these instructions now in the CPU, but at the same time, there is already a uh, machine learning ecosystem out there, like various libraries already exist. So how to integrate all that so that you know we don't build our own stack from scratch? Um, so the lowest level component in our solution is called ZDNN. This is a wrapper around the NNPA instruction that you can use from C language uh, quite conveniently. Uh, so that's one piece. Another piece is called ONNX. This is not something IBM invented. This is Open Neural Network Exchange. This is a data format in which you export, among other things, your trained models. Uh, and the final component is called IBM ZDLC, a deep learning compiler. So what it does, it takes a model in ONNX format and converts it into a shared object. And uh, this shared object, of course, contains calls to ZDNN and to uh, the NNPA function, uh, machine instruction. So yeah, that's uh, the vision of uh, how this, well, not the vision, a lot of this is already implemented and can be used. So that's how these hardware features are integrated in uh, yeah, modern machine learning stacks. And I think that was all about the hardware update. Um, any questions? Uh, so is the AI, ac AI accelerator working on the normal register set or, or does it contain its own registers uh, or whatever oh, else? It's storage. Uh, because I'm, I'm wondering about the kernel context switch, if it needs to be saved or not, and if it needs to be part of make context. For so there is no kernel context switch when starting an NNPA instruction. There is a uh, the information is just passed to a different unit on the same chip, right? The, that, that unit then just get, gets kicked off and gets started doing its thing. So basically it's just the main CPU? Yeah. Well, it, well, internally it has its own state, of course, yeah. but, but that state is then just... Similar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, just hidden behind a single instruction. So. It, right. The, the, so there is no context switch. That's the, that's the difference. Maybe to a graphics card, right? When you when you actually execute this assist instruction, is that synchronous? So like the execution will only continue when the accelerator finished. Yes, okay. exactly. I think there can be, if an interrupt arrives in the middle, then the instruction will stop, but it will say, please restart me, as far as I know. But again, it will store its state in memory, so you don't need to maintain anything in the kernel. So there, there can be a partial completion state, and then you can just restart the instruction. It's exactly the same, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Andres, can you pass the microphone? Regarding the floating format, uh, does it have infinities, nuns? and zeros and stuff like oh, that? Oh, good question. It's, uh, spe uh, so I cannot answer right now, but it's special in this regard. As far as I know, there are no signed zeros, for example, but other details I don't remember, but yeah. And uh, is the plan to uh, offer the 
floating point type for users? No, it's source, just for the just, just the intrinsics. Yes. Okay. Right, the floating point type is not externalized really. It's it's internal. Yeah, I mean, I think format is documented, but uh, it's yeah. The the idea is, I think that it can also be changed in the future. But. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the deal with all the accelerators. If you look at our architecture document, they are documented not under simple instructions, but in their own chapter with a big disclaimer on top that like please use libraries. This is subject to change. But <laughs> it will inevitably lead to some people thinking uh, all this back and forth conversion is really, really slow. So I'm writing my software library towards that floating point format to use the accelerator without any conversions needed. So, so you probably can't change the format anyway in the future <laughs> anymore. So <laughs> you don't have to expose it as a special type, of course, in, in the C language, but uh, you probably can't change it anymore. <laughs> Okay, so if there are no more questions about hardware, huh? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so since we do have compiler people in this room, did, did you think how can this AI accelerator be used from the compiler? So what's, what, uh, what, what has it kind of features that would match a use case inside the compiler? Well, I mean, if we now go into area of, let's say, wild dreams, um, it might be that if a compiler recognizes one of these patterns, it could, in theory, insert this instruction. <laughs> um, so it, it may be similar to vectorization in some areas, but yeah, of course, the data type severely limits the applicability, right? <laughs> yeah. I one can probably exactly represent 8-bit uh, integers. 8-bit uh, so eight, eight integers? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yes, right. <laughs> I, I think Mantisa is 9, right? So it's 9 plus 6 plus sine bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, vectorization of... So, you know, I haven't been paying much attention to this other than I know it exists and we've been looking at the ZDNN low-level library. Um, the thing that, that I'm trying to think of right now is um, Michael mentioned make context. So if the, if the accelerator is just this black box, then we're not saving anything in make context, right? There's no additional register file that needs to be saved. Do you define, there's no procedure call standard changes at all, right? Because there's, there's, you can't call a function that would have any of these things as arguments, I assume, right? There's no PCS change. Um, but I'm just wondering, like, the dynamic loader has uh, auditing functions that let you actually change registers on the fly as you call other functions. But I don't know if we ever want to expose any of these registers in there. Probably not. So I guess it's just is an opaque box, right? Like it's you just prep your data, you call the function, it tries to complete the operation, and it returns back to you the results, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Actually, now that we are talking about it, so what, what, what's the what's the instruction? Actually, this, this thingy assist. Uh, what, what, what's what's the operands of that instruction? A memory blob or a? Memory blob. Ah, yeah. Okay. So it's. It's not even registers or something. No. There's a memory block well, I mean, that, that uh, contains... Address the, of memory block is in the register. Yeah, of but, course. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> there's, there's a single <laughs> register which specifies everything via this memory block. Mm. Uh, I think or, it's okay. even implicit. Like, it's always, re it's always register one or something, as far as I remember. But, yeah, okay, that's tiny details. Okay, 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 I see. Yeah, that was, then there's nothing yeah. really to do. Uh,
Yeah, okay. So with all these accelerators, we actually ran into some problems with the tooling. And uh, yeah, Andreas can talk about this. Yeah, okay. So this is just um, because I, I stumbled in, on this uh, in the context of Valkyrie. So Valkyrie is not a GNU tool per se, but I'm still talking about it now. <laughs> Bear with me. So the problem here is, in general, we, we, have, we have already seen that we not only have this NNPA instruction, but also um, there's already this uh, compression instruction. And in general, how do we support such instructions in tools like Valgrind? It, it, the problem statement is maybe a little bit wider and it would also apply to other tools, but, but I'm focusing on Valgrind now. So, so these, um, these instructions, they are implemented in an on-chip coprocessor as we have seen, right? Uh, they, their behavior is often controlled through a control block, like we discussed before, right? It, you pass the arguments in a memory block. Um, they often operate on large amounts of memory, so the idea is that you can do a mat matrix multiplication with thousands of elements with one instruction, right? Then the instruction comes back and the result is already there. Um, and they are way faster than uh, the software approach would be so yeah um, emulating the, the instructions would be even slower than the software approach and it would result in a slowdown of a factor of I don't know thousand or something um, okay. question uh, we only have one microphone so <laughs> one well, question is 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 the accelerator specified to the very detail or only on the functional level? So can you even emulate something on the instruction level because it's probably not specified on the instruction level? It's really just specified on the functional level, at least in the architecture. So emulating it is difficult anyhow, right? Yeah, that's true. So, okay. Um, so these are problems. Um, other instructions that we also have, which, are, which seem complicated but are way easier, of course, um, is one of, the, one of them is the vector string search instruction. It's, a, it's an instruction that searches um, a string in another string, but the strings are restricted to vector sizes. So the vector is, in, in, in this case, um, a maximum of six, the vector is 16 bytes long, so the string is also 16 bytes long at max. At max. Um, and in that case, we can actually do emulation. It's, it's acceptable, the slowdown is very high, but the instruction doesn't occur that frequently, so it's, it's usually acceptable. Um, so basically the whole loop of what is needed here is unrolled and, uh, and then the whole thing is emulated. Um, or in the case of move, the, the move instruction, move character instruction, the cop which copies up to um, 256 bytes of memory. Um, that instruction is, is also emulated by a loop branching to the instruction itself and decrementing a counter. And just one byte is copied in each iteration, so that's also acceptable. Um, yeah, uh, in the case of NNPA, these both approaches don't work. What, what's another solution in Valgrind is what people have done for other instructions is to implement a dirty helper. Uh, that dirty helper would then basically invoke the instruction by itself and then also provide some wrapper, wrapper logic around that. Um, yes, so this is possible also with the NNPA, of course, it, it can be invoked this way, but then the problem is that um, uh, the memory operations are not instrumented. So Valgrind doesn't see that you read or write any memory and which memory effects you generate with this. So 
the only thing that a dirty helper can do is read or write a very small memory region. Not both, and the memory regions can also not be large. So this is a restriction at the moment. Um, so dirty helpers are not really a solution, I would say. Then there is a te the te tedious solution to forward the NPA, NNPA with a dirty helper, as discussed before, uh, with a dirty helper. And then rely on the application programmer to <laughs> add information about the memory effects, uh, as this is basically done with ASAN. Right? Um, and then there, there's a solution that I'm working on right now, which basically treats this similar to a system call. Um, so system calls are already capable of dealing with large memory regions. They are also tracking the memory effects correctly. So that's basically what I'm looking for to, to do it in this way. So, yeah, that's, I think that's it. Any questions? Um, so the problems you have with the dirty helpers seems to be really limited to wall grind limitations, basically. Because, for instance, in QEMU, it's, it's done this similar way, just without the restrictions. You can, if, if you have complicated instructions that you need to emulate, do you write your helper that implements the functionality of the instructions, including announcing memory effects. So you would write your checking routines there and or checking predicates there, and then it returns. And then and what the emulator does is then inserting a call to that helper routine, right? So uh, without any strange restrictions. So and your idea of doing it with a system like system call handling is basically the same, right? You insert a call, random routine is called at emulation site and well, needs to do whatever it needs to do. So that seems to be the, 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 the sensible solution and I think th there is no reason I can see at least for Valgrind to have the restrictions while the dirty helpers can't be extended to also provide large regions, input and output and so on. So that seems just specific to Valgrind which should be, I think, fixable. Yeah, and so for and for for QEMO, so with the with like things with the vector uh, string search, so the the idea is probably if you if you like uh, implement them with the the QEMO IR that that you get the the code jitted in in the end. Of course, if you do the do magic do magic, then at least you will have a jump from the jitted code into different code or prevent jitting. I'm not sure what QEMO actually does in that case. Yeah. Um, Mark Villard is here. Have you asked him what his opinion is? So, Mar Mark is here. He's a Valgrind developer. Have, okay. Perfect. Does he have an opinion? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm saying you should corner Mark, show him the slides, and ask him his opinion. <laughs> I talked to him before his vacation, I think, and um, at that time I didn't have this proposal yet, so he hasn't seen this yet. So <laughs> I will probably have a chance later. Okay, um, yeah, interesting about QMU. Um, one difference between QMU and Valgrind may, may be that Valgrind is also instrumenting the instructions, not just emulating them. Of course. So maybe, maybe that's one reason why this design looks different. Mm. Presumably, but, but everything that, I mean, there are only limited effect an instruction can have, right, uh, that, that need to be emulated by Valgrind which is all the, the access to memory, maybe some traps, arithmetic or otherwise, and so on. But yeah, all of these needs to be, need to be correctly emulated to be of use for Valgrind. But well, that's what needs to be done then, right? And QEMO needs to do the same. I mean, if there is a trap, 
while loading the memory region that it needs to load, then the QEMO routine also needs to trigger the trap to be, of co to be a correct simulation, right? And yes, Valgrind does a bit more, but on a per instruction level, it's not that much more that, that it correctly needs to represent, right? There are, there are very local effects that an instruction can have, and you know, so they, they should be innumerable. <laughs> So uh, you probably do already emulate the, the compression um, of loading, no? In, 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 in QEMO? No? I mean, um, because of uh, the restrictions of Valgren at the moment, um, we have not emulated any of the complex instructions yet. So neither the compression nor the encryption facilities, right? Nothing like that yet. Because what, what we've seen is that the, the compression of loading can le at least lead to surprising results. Only to you. It's surprising to me. So they, 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 they can result in valid compressed data, but um, non obvious in, in some way. So, and, 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 uh, so the, the question is if it's enough specified. Uh, to emulate the behavior, and if the behavior is even the same between the different Z implementations, probably no, not. No, I think uh, it's, it, it, it varies not even between, not only between chip releases, but really if you call this instruction two times, you will get different deflate streams. They will all decompress, but they will be different, so it's not so deterministic. How, how, how can you reasonably emulate that kind of system. Well, I mean, you don't emulate just, just one to one, Z, right? You just call Zlib yeah, the system. That, yeah, that's what I would do, yeah. Any other questions? Or any other questions to these systems? Um, <laughs> can I have one? Uh, no. Um, uh, the, so the, the question is, how how do you see the the, the vector support evolving? Uh, I mean, we, we can see that even PowerPC, which I assume is kind of a baby step ahead, maybe of the Z ISA in in that regard, uh, is lacking compared to like x86 or ARM in, in features like masking, predication and whatever. Is that going to change or is that not really focus of the two architectures? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really cannot tell you. I, I, I really don't know. So you probably should have to ask somebody else about this. Yeah, I mean, we have these proposals to the hardware team that we submit each time. Yeah, and I think some of them was, some of that was included, but yeah, not, it's not in Z16 yet. <laughs> I mean, we have features that other platforms do not have. I think the, the, the vector string features are not are not very typical, at least. Um, so, but other than that, I, I really don't know what the future brings. I mean, we also have the vector decimal stuff that, yeah, but, that Ilya mm -hmm. just skipped, but <laughs> it's, it's actually interesting, maybe, but uh, nobody uses it at the moment. Yeah, I mean, one of the use cases is converting decimals to strings yeah. really quickly, but unfortunately, it's to it's, it's, it's to it. Yeah. Well, it's portable, but very slow. Except on set. Yeah, we, we, maybe we could speed up something like SPRINDF with that. Yeah. But significantly. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Would be, would be so, yeah, so, so there are features that others don't have. There are certainly features that others have that we don't have. And I, I really don't know what the plan is to, to bring them or not. We, we also have some restrictions in the instruction formats, I think, that limit us a, a little bit. But other than that, I don't know exactly what the plan is.
But so far, uh, vectors have already provided a significant speed up, of course. In the, since we have them, yeah, they, they were pretty useful already. Any other questions about these systems? Yeah, I think the, the reason why Richard is asking is because especially masked uh, instructions provide some very good means to, for compilers to use them and make more loops vectorizable in size constraints uh, application, well, well that's functions. Uh, so so, so it, it would be helpful for more architectures to have them. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you, you, you probably know that we have very limited masking features. <laughs> we, can, we have vector load with length, and we have uh, the capability of using just the first element of a vector, a floating point vector, <laughs> something like that. But yeah, okay, so that's. I shouldn't have mentioned that, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, but it's an interesting point about uh, instruction um, format. So ca we need four arguments, right, for masking instructions. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's definitely not going to fit easily. Of course, we could start using register pairs or something for that, but yeah, that can complicate things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I think we should <laughs> note that masking is important. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. At that time, I th who was there? Andreas was there, I guess. Andreas Krebel. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'm always following, telling this to the four VC folks, but it's all I didn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe Red Hat can help now. <laughs> okay, another question here. So, for the accelerator instructions, did you define some kind of intrinsics API to use it? With maybe, I don't know, a pointer to memory that it does it accelerating into? Oh, no, not really. We didn't do anything in the compiler, of course, in libraries that implement them, so not implement, but wrap them like zlib and uh, zdnn. We have that, but it's like, yeah, internal. Right. But yeah, you can always copy paste it from there into your own code. <laughs> cool. And I was just that for various of these, I don't know, matrix or operations recently, I know that Clang has added some kind of matrix data type extension, which is sort, of, sort of like a vector extension, but it's two dimensional, and they overload like the plus, minus, and multiplication operators for them. So I was kind of wondering over the last ah, year whether GCC such, would want to adopt high level wrappers. It's not really related to, your, to any architecture particularly, it's a higher level abstraction. Mm -hmm. Middle end couldn't decompose it to whatever ISA it would want. Oh, that's a good question. But yeah, right now I can't answer if anything like this exists. But it could be part of ZDNN, but no, no promises. <laughs> Any more questions? So I don't know if I, I missed it, but any information about the cryptography facility, especially the post-quantum cryptography support? Oh, I haven't included it into slides, but okay. yeah, in, uh, in Z16, there is this new Crypto Express 8, I think, card that provides two quantum safe algorithms, I think, for key exchange and, and uh, key establishment and digital signatures. Yeah, so it's, it's there. <laughs> No, that, that, that one is separate. Mm -hmm.